Um, so thank you so much for inviting me. It's a huge pleasure and a real privilege to be asked to do this talk. The discussions, I mean, that, that background that Jeremy just summarised is, you know, I know held in common by most folk here are interested in and engaging in that kind of work. So it's a real privilege to be part of these discussions over the last day. Really rich, really interesting, and I hope I can help uh, take some of these strands forward. I'm going to... Um, try with my talk to ground it in some of the discussions we've already had and then say a little bit about what I think might be something that can be done about it. Uh, so it's sticking the neck out a little bit, but uh, we'll see how that goes down. Um, so there's been, it's an academic gathering, there's been some dissent, but we seem pretty clear there is a crisis uh, of some kind, but a crisis in what? And the background documents and the discussion so far have really nicely illustrated one part of that, uh, the undermining, the erosion of what had formerly, at least in our imaginations, been strongly constituted authorities, legitimacies of expertise. Um, and this, there are some set piece examples, but they of course go much deeper than the individual instances um, and it's interesting how even, this is Andy Haldane, uh, another one of the sort of set piece examples, acknowledging what else could one do after the economic crisis, how economics as a discipline, as a body of expertise in its own right, is in crisis from the inside. So that's clear. But we've touched on it a few times in discussion, but there is of course the flip side of that a crisis of expertise in which the crisis is constituted not by erosion and destabilization, but by overbearing assertiveness and entrenchment and association in that with incumbent power concentrations in the world. So I just, again, very familiar to all of us, I think, but I, want, I think we've given a little bit less attention, despite some really nice uh, spotlights put on it, to that limb of the crisis. Of course, they're not separate, they're co-constituting. The rightful place of science, interestingly enig left enigmatic as to exactly what that might be, but we see what that might be in a really quite interestingly diverse set of interventions at very high level in global politics over the last few years, from the most surprising of sources, actually coming from directions that are in other respects strongly counterposed with one another, very aware of con contending identities, and yet nonetheless subscribing to this remarkably similar picture of the role of science. One cannot impede scientific progress, invoked when uh, an incumbent is successful in associating progress with the particular course of action, as we've heard in discussions. And then the language, dodgy dossiers or not, that one sees routinely on contested areas of science, technology, innovation, institutional change generally. Now, we also see this where expertise is associated not just with uh, diagnosing or understanding the world, but with developing ostensibly new interventions, innovation, the innovation discourse. And I just want to pause for a moment to just reflect on how remarkable it is that we have a ubiquitous language around the world, as far as I'm aware, of pro-innovation policies, pro-innovation strategies, as if that means something. It even, it's ascended to arguably the highest level of discourse in European Commission policymaking. So this isn't just an academic picking gleefully on some little thing they can play with. This is a really strongly ordering idea, and yet, the whole point about innovation, no matter what approach we take to it, and there are many arguing like cats in the bag about vocabularies and what various concepts might mean. Nonetheless, what's agreed is the, the main point about innovation is it's an evolutionary emergent process with path dependencies, positive feedbacks. In other words, that the main question in innovation in any given sector, no matter how narrow, is which way, not how fast. The main questions are about what innovation, whether in biotech, health more generally, agriculture, energy. And yet somehow, 
in the mainstream citadels, the highest level of policymaking on these very questions, the most common kind of language is about simply being pro-innovation. To maybe over-egg it a little bit, it's a kind of North Korean style discourse. <coughs> Imagine if we spoke about policy in that way. If somebody contested a policy and was told by an incumbent, I can't be dealing with you, you're just anti-policy, I'm pro-policy. That's the way we talk about expertise associated with science, technology, innovation. And if you think that example was a little bit over colorful, then we see there's no shortage of instances where this is made absolutely explicit. James Lovelock here talking about the crisis in the first sense in climate change recognition and uh, respect for climate change expertise, meaning that actually we should put democracy on hold for a while. And the main European Commission official news website had a piece a little while ago asking the question about whether now democracy is the enemy of nature. So that's a pretty good contender for a crisis of expertise as well, I think, but of the opposite kind. Now, again, there's a very diverse set of experiences and expertise in the room. Um, but... And the point has been made very well several times quite briefly. I just want to elaborate a little bit. One way of understanding this, which is to see, which owes, of course, its debt to work in the science and technology studies more than anywhere else, where maybe some of the discussions that we more generally than in this room tend to have about expertise are a little bit misled by taking what it says on the tin at face value, that it's about knowledge. Expertise is somehow about knowledge. <laughs> Now, of course, it is, in many, certainly in many of its uh, uh, performances. But actually, if you look at it functionally in society, it's difficult to escape a conclusion, no matter what political perspective one comes from, that expertise is at least as much about justification, we've heard Habermas mentioned yesterday, as about veracity. It doesn't matter so much what the quality of the content is. It's the authority provided by the uh, discourse. So to illustrate that, I just want to show, for, and uh, there may be folk who think that's a slightly over-assertive outline of the, of the situation, that I'm being unfair on expertise in saying it's mainly about justification in its social function. Uh, let me just look at a picture that I would contend is common across the entire panoply of areas of regulation of governance of science and technology. So if you disagree with that, please hold me to account for that. And I'm going to illustrate it by reference to, arguably, the field in which the role of expertise in adjudicating decisions on technologies is best developed over many decades. The techniques, the paraphernalia, the body language, the institutional settings are at their most sophisticated in the regulation of energy technology. It is routinely the case that the products of expertise in fields like cost-benefit analysis, we heard about yesterday, risk assessment, are taken literally, the very numbers themselves, incorporated into law regulatory law. And the picture given by expertise in this field is that yes, when we look at it long enough and have a big enough budget, we will come up with ostensibly precise figures, numbers, for the risk or the impact or the uh, externalities attached to different policy choices. And by looking at this picture, whether from a big uh, Research Council, Academy of Science document, or from a scientific advisory committee, policymakers can get the impression, and more importantly, give the impression, that they are basing the onward decisions on this definitive authority. And yet it is typically the case in energy, just like in transport, in agriculture, in health, in materials, I would contend, based on, the pre this is a, 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 an empirical meta-analysis of studies, Cited in policymaking in OECD countries, in the fashion I've mentioned, 21 studies in this case, that you typically see an enormous range of diverse pictures of the risk or the impact or the life cycle uh, effects of any given policy choice. Extremely diverse. I'm using a logarithmic scale here to show them. The typical range of values in any metric varies by several uh, orders of magnitude in the peer-reviewed literature. And the same is true for all the different policy choices. So I would say that a predicament of expertise, which has always been so, it's not a crisis now, it has always been the case 
that expertise can basically deliver, subject to its own disciplinary strictures and principles of rigor, any answer you like about what the relative orderings are of different policy choices. So much for evidence-based policy in ways we heard really nicely yesterday. And yet it is routinely the case that these literatures are invoked selectively to justify particular choices. So that, I think, is overwhelming evidence that, in fact, expertise in its social functions, political functions, is about justification more than about veracity. And the reason is very clear. I mean, many people in the room have contributed to understanding this about all uh, expert knowledge represented in regulatory or in research terms is framed in its social context. It's constituted by institutions, by practices, by imaginations. Um, and of course, this is equally true. It's, the point is often made most strongly about quantitative analytic expertise. It's equally true of interpretive, constructivist, reflexive expertise as well. There are innumerable parameters and factors that affect this, which do not involve denigrating individuals, whether political or expert. This is not people acting in bad faith. It is simply the fact that the adoption of divergent, equally valid framing assumptions in the, in the constituting of any body of knowledge can deliver radically different answers in ways our society does not acknowledge because it's inconvenient. Discount rates, system boundaries, constituting of proof, the choice of metrics, the recruitment of experts, ex accreditation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have now and again here, as, as happens routinely, then turn to this question of the crisis, the relationship between expertise and democracy, as a, in a sort of 1D zero-sum fashion. There were some great discussions yesterday, but I, saw, I, I don't mean to uh, disagree with points that were actually really uh, fascinating, but the notion of a Goldilocks equilibrium. <laughs> Or has the Enlightenment gone too far, maybe go back again? This sort of slightly one-dimensional idea, which serves a great purpose in some ways, but if we were to look at about how much expertise we need, as if it's a striking a balance on that fashion, we miss what I would say could be the single most important point, which is true whether, as again referring back to yesterday, we think of truth, a hotly contested idea and ambiguous, but both in epistemic and in ontological terms, as somehow being singular. I'm not aware in any of the really interesting groundings we heard yesterday of a reason why truth has to be singular. One can be as assertive and as positivistic as one wishes and it still yet be plural. And just to give you a probably a little bit trite example of how this can be, there is a phenomenon in the room <laughs> and any phenomenon in the room will look radically different, depending on the view, the configuration. So this is a named phenomenon, in fact, one that's often in a room, discursively. <laughs> and it, it looks different. The, the, we know we have a name for it in this case. Many of the phenomena we're talking about with expertise of the kind we're interested in don't have these settled, stabilized names. So the configuration speaks for the, for the phenomenon. And it looks radically different, just like an elephant would in the room. And we again sometimes get a little bit anxious and sometimes there are over accusations that to go too far down that road of acknowledging plurality is somehow opening the floodgates to relativism. And I just want to again, hopefully not too ostentatiously, but just emphasize the point that just because we acknowledge there are many different equally valid contrasting represent representations that are equally true does not mean that anything goes. It does not mean that we somehow relinquished the right or the basis to identify when things are just plain wrong. Error still has meaning in that plural view. There is not, for instance, a whale or a vase of flowers in the room. Actually, you know, anyway, no, we won't go too far with that one. Uh, and you may, for those of you who know, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy or a book, there's a nice passage in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy riffing around this. And also, just as an aside here, I can't resist. Uh, we're interdisciplinary as a group. Many of us are social scientists. You get a few bruises as a social scientist working in an interdisciplinary way in policy circles with natural scientists. There is an epistemic hierarchy. And one can, maybe not entirely persuasively, but 
at least take a good look at that epistemic hierarchy by observing that the degree to which it is possible to represent a phenomenon in a singular and definitive way becomes greater, it becomes easier with ontological distance, with atoms, with, uh, with uh, physical properties, magnetic fields, biological species, ontologically remote from the social milieu of science, it is easier to portray them as singular and definitive in the fashion that's so expedient. If you're a social scientist, as Anthony Giddens observed with his double hermeneutic, the object is a subject. It's society uniquely among sciences. It's society viewing itself. So it's not surprising then that you get a picture like this. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's a bit near breakfast. The inside of the elephant. <laughs> Sorry, I, know, I always go too far. <clears throat> I think, anyway, I hope the point was made despite my slightly strained analogies. So the point is then that these definitive ideas of expertise reinforce incumbency, aggregation, reduction, not expertise itself, but these things we associate with it and assume are intrinsic, parameterize the imaginations and have the effect of reinforcing other kinds of positive feedback effects, which entrench existing trajectories, which are no, in no means inevitable and subvert appreciations for the openness of choice, for complexity, for uncertainty, which is not aggregatable, context sensitivity, and these multiple different framings. And so in practice, in science and technology, we see that these questions of direction that I began by noting are systematically deleted. We speak about the questions to ask about science, about research, about innovation and technology, as if they are about how fast, what risk, what modalities might we employ in implementing some supposedly inevitable trajectory when in fact the biggest questions are about direction, which we're not even equipped with a vocabulary to deal with. And so there is a crisis of expertise, which is much closer to the second than the first kind. And that's why we see, to be concrete about it, such an enormous orders of magnitude greater resources put into trajectories involving technologies and practices, technologies which the value of which can be appropriated, especially intellectually uh, IP intensive technologies where you've got a clear basis for rent on the, on the intellectual property, on the supply chain. We, we know this is, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, this is how capitalism works, it's how industrial systems work more generally. So these are the things, these are the incumbent configurations that will be reinforced if we don't talk a bit more openly about these dynamics. And it has huge implications for health sector, for, for agriculture, for energy. So even the idea that we, again, we, we played with yesterday of whether, ex, whether it's possible to speak for science, the idea that science and knowledge can be spoken for in some individual way is highly problematic. Whatever position we take, just to organize debate on, on that implies that, that there is uh, no alternative, no scope for discussion outside that frame. And even when expertise is self-consciously critical of incumbency. For instance, in many discussions of sustainability transitions around the world at the moment, which I greatly respect and learn much from, nonetheless, there tends to be that definite article in front, the sustainability transition, with models and missions and handbooks and manuals plotting out roadmaps. Here's a cover of an, a document in the European Union recently, where on the front page, it emphasizes in bold letters, the questions we're allowed to ask, what cost and what speed, not which way. I mean, it's interesting how often, have a look at it, it's a game you can play, look at roadmaps, roadmap documents, you must have them here in Australia, well, I think, and just see if you can find any with more than one road. It's very strange, isn't it? Who needs a roadmap when there's only one road? But that's what we get. And so the contrast there is with this idea of the transition is, well, what happened to the open, plural, emergent actualities of transformation? As we've experienced, any instance of progressive, especially transformation, liberation from, to the extent they've occurred, from colonization, from slavery, from class oppression, from women's exploitation, suppression of marginal sexualities, these things that are partly unfinished business, but reconstitute transformations as ambitious as anything around sustainability have been achieved over many decades. 
but they certainly weren't by the transition plotted in a top-down fashion on the basis of evidence-based analysis provided by experts. That is not how this type of thing occurs, and yet we pretend it is. And so I want to now spend the, the part, last part of my talk then trying to deliver on, well, okay, what can we do about it? And many people have already addressed that very well in the discussion so far. But sustainability I want to bring to the fore, actually. It's a bit hackneyed. Academics don't make a name now so easily by, by um, celebrating something that's so well, in fact, overly uh, discussed. But sustainability has the quality of, a, of, a, is, of being absolutely at the highest levels of international discourse uh, and embedded in research agendas, grand challenges, so-called, uh, as well. And for all its flaws, it is constituted deeply on the idea that normat expertise is conditional on normativity. It's explicitly normative, based on decades of struggle by social movements on issues of social equity, human well-being, ecological integrity, and the Brundtland formula, which is still at the center of the Sustainable Development Goals, emphasized in ways that are somewhat diminished into the background, the importance of citizen participation and greater democracy, not just in, the, in modalities for implementation, but in identifying what it is that sustainability even means. Democracy of expertise. So we, um, Sheila introduced, I think, really importantly yesterday, and it's something that pops up in various parts of the literature, the notion of a second enlightenment. And I, I, I would, you know, maybe it's under our noses. Because our pro-innovation discourses, an enlightenment discourse, if ever there was one, simply speaking of the rate and the, of, of innovation and who's in front, who's behind, is an enlightenment discourse. But it completely misses the most important quality, which is direction. Sustainability, over decades, has been a very prominent deliberation process, a remarkable one around the world, about direction. Some things are just plain unsustainable, and we give them undue attention. I mean, the war, for instance, is remarkable how it's absent from these discourses. But nonetheless, it's about the normative directions to allow us to discuss progress in a fashion that's not hobbled, and, and, and then also constitute expertise in a way that's not susceptible to this 1D zero-sum trade-off. In other words, actually, expertise can be recognized to be, again, to pick up a, a, a phrase nicely used by Sheila yesterday, fractal. That within any given field, there'll be this fractal property that the, the, the patternings we see at one level will be reproduced at other levels. And you can't, no matter how precise you are, you can't be sure you won't have a microcosm of the scope for dissent and contestation within it. And also important is the body language of sustainability. It's rooted in counter expertise, whether it be in the constituting of the canonical problems, pesticides, uh, toxic substances, ionizing radiation, heavy metals, carcinogens, chlorofluorocarbons, endocrine disrupting chemicals, you name it. Each one of these stories that constitutes this, certainly the environmental, the more expert intensive side of sustainability were time and again repudiated, rejected by co incumbent conventional expertise in that field accredited in that field, in academia, in government, in business. And only after decades of struggle was it reluctantly conceded the counter expertise is now in retrospect regarded as being more robust. And likewise on the so-called solutions. Sustainable agriculture, renewable energy, super efficiency in uh, the built environment, uh, closed cycle production systems. Again, there's lots of argument around it, but nowadays these are basically the received wisdom about how we should go, but I'm not, uh, I'm old enough to remember a time when each of these was actively ridiculed by conventional established expertise in the respective fields as being absolutely way out. And we don't reflect enough on that massive hegemonic change. So that body language of counter, recognize actually counter expertise. First of all, you see the plurality of expertise. And second, you see how power can act in the way I said to suppress and resist things that may be no brainers. So even the SDGs, for all their many flaws, allow, if we want to take it, an opportunity at the highest levels for all the compromises, an embodiment of this kind of discourse, the plurality that's decried so often by governance specialists. It's too complicated. Well, yes, absolutely. That is one of the most important features, the plurality. And it applies not just between the stated aims, 169 targets and metrics that are provided 
but within them as well. It recognizes the conditionalities attached to expertise and knowledge and provides us with a basis for taking that seriously in a way that other debates uh, of the kind I began this talk with typically don't. So the humility that we discussed yesterday is engendered by just bringing power to the fore and without romanticizing social movements because they're as prone to getting things wrong as anyone else. It's not that they get things right, it's just that power which is not also not a bad thing, but it has the effects we know very well of suppressing until uh, late in the day realization of alternatives. And it is in civil society and social movements we see these highlighted and brought to the fore and counter expertise deployed in those fashions. So collective agency, political struggle and choice constitute the salience of expertise. It's not about evidence based policy. It's about um, what is the basis for what we might even construe as being salient evidence. And I make this point, which may seem obvious, certainly in the context of our discussions we've been having, because actually, again, the term Anthropocene has come up a few times. Uh, there's a very healthy body of critique around that in Australia, especially, but as, as well as being a very strong uh, uh, propounding of the idea. But increasingly, whether it be on planetary boundaries or on the Anthropocene, we see this shift away from sustainability framings for all its entrenchment in international institutions, that the challenge is one of planetary management. <laughs> planetary management. We've been so successful managing ourselves as societies that now it's time for us to step up and manage the whole planet with equal success. But we see also the assertion here of remarkable visions of expertise that it uh, is concerned with non-negotiable control variables of the earth. That there is absolutely, these are quotes from nature and science, absolutely no uncertainty about these parameters, no room for compromise. Humanity is a control force and expertise is a means to what is explicitly, repeatedly referred to as domination. So it's alive and well, this other view. And I think it's also clear this isn't just abstruse critique, it's clear where it leads. The technologies are very clearly there as candidates that can deliver on this to stabilize optimal Holocene conditions. This is about climate geoengineering. It doesn't matter that we haven't a hope in the proverbial of actually delivering on these. The point is we're drumming up imaginations that will make us believe that we can because of this style of framing around sustainability. So I think there is plenty that can be done and so science and technology studies especially, but other disciplines too including the most positivistic disciplines, have a lot to say about what can be done. And I want to end my talk on that note about practice, the practice of expertise, the institutional cultures that it reproduces, can alternatively emphasize the broadening out or narrowing down of scope and the opening up and the closing down of engagements with policy. So, by that I mean the inputs, good, the inputs to expertise, the inputs to knowledge can be relatively narrow or broad in terms of the, the problem definitions, the policy options that are considered, the range of pros and cons that are taken into account, the breadth of uncertainties that are acknowledged, the perspectives that are invited with their own counter expertise to, to stand with equal authority as inputs, but also the outputs of these expert practices can be relatively closing down of political discourse. Here is your prescriptive recommendation, Minister. Here's our enormous study. Here's a recommendation where you deliver justification in the fashion that's so welcomed or opening up. You can still be quantitative here. You can use sensitivity analysis. <laughs> the tools that can be used are very wide to show how well you get answer A under conditions X, but you get answer B under conditions Y. <laughs> And it's not our job as experts to arbitrate between those. We're simply informing a wider debate. And this applies equally to quantitative analytic approaches, to participatory approaches. They're not a get out of jail free card. And although methods, like for instance here as an example, decision analysis, don't locate neatly, it's a fractal problem. <laughs> the, the devil is in the detail. But nonetheless, one can implement a range of different methods of de very different kinds in fashions that are either up the top left, giving this unduly precise picture of what expertise can do, acknowledging uncertainty, or at the bottom right, rigorously unpicking the particular conditions and perspectives under which 
you get different answers about the different orderings of different policy choices. The same is true of participation. So one can notionally populate, this is drawing on work I've done in the UK with the Step Center, um, different methods across that field. And the point here is not to say that techniques with their cultures like cost benefit, risk assessment, optimizing models are somehow bad. It's just to be conscious of the functional role they play and that they are systematically massively favored because of the political pressures for closure, which are not in themselves necessarily bad either. But if we simply view these things neutrally, we don't take account that power wants justification. It will reward massively experts who are prepared to present themselves in that fashion. And that's not necessarily delivering on the expertise. It's delivering a political resource, which is not necessarily a bad thing. People may make a decision, but let's at least talk about it. So instead of speaking truth to power, let's speak about power. <laughs> power in knowledge, as well as elsewhere. And in particular, about the responsibility without being a heart on the sleeve radical, because power is not necessarily a bad thing, it's just it much more likely to become a bad thing if it's not balanced out. So a responsibility in expertise, no matter what political persuasion one might have, is to be part of that process of balancing the effects of power, rather than denying that they exist. And this occurs in a wider context. Expertise is not as it likes to present itself, and as it gets treated by its sponsors being the driver, as we heard yesterday very eloquently, often it's simply providing this resource, this justification. So what really the opportunities for affecting these influences on direction come when social movements, when dissent, when crises of other kinds, like we heard about BSE yesterday, create conditions for that. When these other methods in the bottom and the left on the right-hand side can get more attention. Because the real way in which change is affected is much more like a flocking behavior than like a top-down control uh, cockpit which experts speak to. So we can look at the power relations in multidisciplinarity. I won't labor these points. But the difference is between multidisciplinarity, where there's a single organizing discipline, normal in international assessments, in the top left. And yes, you've got other disciplines. But look at the terms of trade. Interdisciplinarity, which in power terms, uh, people get confused quite often about the difference. In power terms, they're very clear. The terms of trade are more equal. And transdisciplinarity, where the status afforded to non-disciplinary non knowledge is much more equal as well. So one can just, I mean, I'm not trying to push this particular model with my overblown diagrams, which take me ages, so I always use them. But um, it's the point, talk about power, you may come to different conclusions. So to conclude, a frame in which we can see this crisis of expertise of both sides constituting each other might be informed by thinking back to the origins of science itself as an anti-authoritarian social movement. In the 1660s, the motto of the Royal Society uh, was nullius in verba, not on authority, a motto that interestingly disappeared as the logo, as the, uh, as the epithet in more recent years when the motto became excellence in science. Now I can overblow that point, but I think we can see a kind of secular dynamics of succession where these dynamics of justification operate over many generations and science over those generations moves from one side to the other side just through processes of institutionalization, entrenchment. And that's maybe what we're facing rather than more immediate things to do with authoritarian populism on their own. So I'm saying then that the realities of change, whether scientific, technological, innovation, are much more open than they're conceded as being. They're generally looked at in a very narrow sense. Expertise gives us this unduly closed picture, informs policymaking such as to close down debate about alternatives and thereby reinforces lock-in to protect you in whatever sector. And I'm saying we can do very practical things, spanning boundaries between different types of expertise by broadening out the appreciations of the implications and the diversities of choices that actually exist in any given setting, water management, energy, et cetera, health, et cetera. But also, crucially, not just doing an enormous assessment of wide breadth, but conveying that honestly to policymaking as a responsibility of expertise, a responsibility, interestingly, not emphasized in most forms of responsible innovation, to inform a broader debate which sustains a greater level of diversity. And so I think we can see then that 
we can reconcile these unduly sundered domains, cultural domains of science and expert, of scientific expertise and democracy by recognizing, again, as Sheila pointed out at the beginning, they are in fact different sides of the same coin. And I think some of the things I've tried to point to might be of practical assistance in doing that. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much. I, I'd like to take it a slide at a time and really think about it, but we don't have time to do that. So I have sort of three interrelated points. First is the possibility of multiple futures, so not just multiple discourses and disruption, but how that might lead to m multiple courses of action that are simultaneously put in place, which I, you know. The second is if that's a consequence of what you're suggesting, what are the means of accountability? So it makes it, 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 so that if we're looking at something like emissions or if we're looking at something like um, water, um, the impact on water, or if we're looking at something like the impact on, on indigenous health or, or whatever it is, um, the, the problem of accountability becomes more complicated. Uh, thanks, Andy. Um, uh, just on your point about uh, facts being socially constructed, but also that doesn't mean that anything goes. So where is that line and how do we judge? Um, and the other point is that as a scientist, we're trained to provide simple and accessible um, messages to policymakers um, and to reduce uncertainty where, you know, possible. Um, but also we will, you know, Mentioned, Professor Jasanoff mentioned yesterday that you know, leaving room for uncertainty provides scope for merchants of doubt to come in and, and play around with that. So, yeah, I guess there's some tensions there that mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious about your yep. thoughts on. Thanks. I have a slightly different angle. Uh, the, I'd like to pick up on one point you made about geoengineering. Uh, there appears to be an increasing trend to shall we say, scientificate reasons for not action. Uh, promoting geoengineering is a great way of delaying action. Uh, it's, uh, you may be forced into trying to do it, but the point is it's being used in the reverse way. Yep. So these types of structural abuse of the expertise are very difficult to manage yep. because they give energy to those who are trying to make the impossible possible case it's needed and that supports the inverse effective policy. Yep. Thank you. So, yeah, thanks. Well great points as ever in these discussions. I'll take them in reverse order if that's okay. So on the geoengineering, you're absolutely right. The moral hazard point is very well made. Um, but I would say because I've been quite hard on geoengineering in ways that you know it's not so exceptional. It's a particularly acute case. Um, the IPCC itself I mean, where, when did we decide, given, I mean, given the success that was had with, relatively with governance of other environmental problems, uh, whereby we as a society or as individual societies decided on this emission, these emissions are not right. We can't quantify exactly what the damage is, but we can quantify the emissions and the scale of the problem. We need to reduce it. With the IPCC, in a much more intractable case, because the depth of the industry, we've decided we will in fact claim, and it's under pressure to do so of course, to be able to model the entire Earth's climate and identify temperature increments in what would otherwise be a notionally stable climate, which have to be achieved. So even before you get to climate geoengineering in the forms that you're right about, you get this discourse, which has departed in ways that we discussed yesterday a little bit, this technocratization of, of the discourse, to be incredibly hubristic about what a valid basis for intervention might be, compared to relatively successful interventions on other environmental contaminants. So that goes into the merchants of doubt point. That so it doesn't to, to raise these kinds of concerns doesn't mean uh, concerns about this performed fidelity with which we can understand the systems before we can act. We haven't actually done that in the past with other kinds of environmental regulation. And in fact, I'd say on climate change, like on many others, by actually opening the box and looking inside, as a social, acknowledging that the IPCC, as other scientific processes, is a social process. 
So let us look at the qualities of that social process. And they are so different to the qualities of the social processes that give rise to the critical knowledge. And yet somehow the IPCC and that kind of discourse, by wanting to perform dis transcendent expertise, speaking from on high with no social context to it, is actually doing itself harm. Because then you get the same body language of transcendent expertise from the other side without encouraging, let's look at not just how many scientists are saying this or that, but what are the kinds of processes that are undertaken? Who's funding it? And those kinds of questions. So I, I think that the problem of, of merchants of doubt and the, you know, the tobacco industry was a particular case of this, are the, the way of dealing with them is in, enhanced rather than diminished by recognizing the social context of expertise in the ways I and others here have been struggling for. Um, but I, I, it's a tricky one, and the temptations are very great to try and uh, put on those clothes. And then the point about accountability and multiple futures, absolutely, that's what I'm trying to, I mean, I am, I am trying to get at that. I'm, it's highly imperfect. I'm trying to point to practices and institutions and methods that can lend greater accountability by being plural and conditional, by acknowledging their constituting context to a greater extent. And th so I am trying to struggle as, as part of a much wider, you know, we all are, I guess, in a way, towards exactly what you said and cannot claim to deliver it by these relatively, you know, sort of facile means. But that's the, that is the struggle. But what is clear to me, despite the doubt over the exact, we have to just keep arguing, like with the, like on the point about, you know, the answer, how do we deal with the constituted nature of science? We just argue, we recognize deliberation and argument, skepticism, rational, interrogation are the means by which we have the best way of identifying what's robust and what not. Um, Andy, this is an invitation to say more because there's so much convergence between what you think about these things and what I think yeah. about these things. But we've also been enacting these part of the events for exactly that reason. And I was wondering whether you could say something about a word that you haven't talked about very much, which is institutions. That you know, obviously the insights you're talking about are no longer limited to just you and me. There are entire bodies of knowledge. Uh, but the, the attempt to overthrow a certain set of views, which, um, you know, you encounter even at Spru, and I certainly encounter in a setting where I have the longest serving science advisor to a US president sitting several doors away from me. Uh, and you know, it, that barrier, you know, a liberal Democrat, yeah. science advisor to yeah. the president, uh, anything that I would want to say along these lines cannot cross the ether between us. And, no. you know, what is that? And, yeah. and how do you, you know, what kind of um, prescriptions might yes. you have for yes. the institutional structures that we both know to be so incredibly embedded? Yes. Thank you. I've, um, I was sitting here saying yes, 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 but then when you commented on the IPCC, it sort of made me think, ooh, mm -hmm. uh, because I regard that as a, a rather extraordinary and important social invention um, with all its faults. So, I, I mean, we need, we need to know that when you pour a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and other greenhouse gases, something is going to happen. Mm. And the IPCC attempts to put some sort of estimation of error in a sort of mm -hmm. translatable fashion onto its, mm -hmm. its predictions. Um, and it, of course, has lots of faults like um, embracing Beck's without much query for its energy uh, uh, strategies. But I, I, I'm just now, I'm curious to know, what would you... What would you put in place of the IPCC, or would you have a different IPCC um, in relation to the critical issue of climate change? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Actually, I wanted to ask a hyped up manic version of your question, which I don't think was, was quite addressed directly. So the way I'm going to do it, actually, is I'm going to quote from you. So I pulled up an article, and this is because I'm good friends with Benjamin Sobercool that you work with at Sprue. So this is an article that you and Ben wrote criticising the Silly Breakthrough Institute people and their estimates of nuclear construction costs. Yes. So, can you just hold this for me? Let's look at some of the words. The Nordhaus Institute, or the Nordhaus estimates, is, is, is limited. The methodological treatments, or the methodological choices are very limited. They draw narrowly applicable results. 
and I'll skip to the end, they have recourse to a selective choice of data, unbalanced analysis, biased interpretation. Now what's interesting about that is that that really gives the manic version to your question because we all struggle with perspectivism as an opening point yeah. and as a broadening of analysis, but yeah. then we also struggle with the idea that people then say to us, as silly relativists apparently, it does anything go? And we go, no, it's not anything goes. Yes. So it's that swap, and we see it in that language there, because at that point we're saying, and I agree with Ben and your analysis there of Nordhaus, they were yes. completely wrong, yeah. but see, we swap to the closing down there as well. Yes. And the question, and the scientists ask it all the time, how do we draw that line? Yeah. Yeah, what's, yeah. Our, what's our method? And I guess for me the yeah. question theoretically is, is perspectivism the correct kind of theoretical resource for telling us about how we do our closings down? Yes. And I think we all struggle with that. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> There's a case of hoist by your own petard there, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, ni nicely made point. And, um, and thanks for doing it so graciously. And you're right. There's, I mean, actually, though, you don't need to go as far as finding an article co-written with someone else. To, which we, to, cause the way I've deported myself today hasn't been lacking in <laughs> assertiveness, I think. And that's where I think the medium is a message there, too. I, the, the, the implication for me of being plural and conditional is not to somehow say I'll have to assume the body language of an individually reflexive person in a Zen state. <laughs> who will somehow, ironically, become something like an objectified expert on, on steroids to pick up your... Because, you know, that aspirations to reflexivity, when located individually, can basically look very like objective expertise. If instead we see reflexivity in the way, the fashion that's needed, I think in both the view you've been representing and me, is a distributed relational phenomenon, then one can speak to the importance of that and say, I'll, I'll, I'll die in the ditch for that, but within that, I'm going to play my role flawed as it might be, acting in a, in a different register. So I've done that today in the way I put out these particular views. I did it again with Benjamin, and often you do use language with others that are not necessarily the ones you would choose on your own. I've left to my own devices, my language is usually too impenetrable, so it's just as well, probably. But so that, that's my imperfect answer. You're right, it's a fair point, we should constantly be challenged. But you do subject yourself to challenge of that kind, which is, a, is an important challenge to be open to, I think. So I would defend being using that kind of language, talking like I'm talking, at the same time as defending a radical kind of pluralism, at the same time as saying, but that doesn't mean anything goes. I think that's where we are. That's as far as we can get with this stuff. And it's a much more healthy framework for debate than the one that conventional discussions of expertise would say. Um, the point on the IPCC, what to do instead, I mean, yeah, I don't want to join the you know, horrible sort of amount of critique of IPCC. I do have a critique of it, but that's not the point. The IPCC is a remarkable institution. It's a, a fantastic thing for global society to come together in a way that set a scene for other integrated assessments, of which there have been better ones. I think the agricultural assessment was better than the IPCC. So without going into the details, I mean, it, it's interesting. Industry pulled out. That's when you got a pretty good sign that you're doing something right. Um, again, a, a point you might want to pick me up on. Um, so I, I would say, no, it's, I mean, it was a shame that it took 10 to 15 years for the IPCC to acknowledge uncertainty in the fashion they are now doing better because the damage was done by that body language. But I still think one could actually address, in a world where the alternatives in the energy sector, which are the most single important area, only one of which, only one area admittedly, are so manifestly attractive. The renewables, <laughs> the economics of renewables now is just stunning for someone like me advocating it for decades. For the IPCC to think that we somehow have to still perform this calculation of optimal temperature and the whole, in order to get a substitution here is odd. So I would put much more emphasis on let's just <laughs> substitute, let's find instruments, which they are doing a good job of, of, of providing an arena for as well. So it's not so different, but it would be more like the International Agricultural Assessment. And Sheila's point. Um, institutions, yes, I do try. I mean, you've, over the years, I try to do better with acknowledging you. I had defensive language at several points, Sheila, on the institutions, which you'll have noticed. But you're right. Um, I, I, I tend to have a focus more on methodological practices. I'm in danger of romanticizing, rarefying methods in the end. I want to say concrete things that can be done on an basis of individual research, so that's why I would not apologize for that, but it has dangers. But I would say of the relationship, it's a danger to think that somehow 
um, you know, plug and play, some method will somehow get you get out of jail free card. It's romantic and it's silly. You have to look at institutions and practices around it and cultures beyond that, actually. And imaginaries, as you yourself point to, at almost the highest level of aggregation, really matter. But the, the a consequence of the fractal, non-scaled understanding that you pointed to yesterday is that the determinisms work rhizomically always. So there are, in fact, conditioning effects exercised by method on institutions, as well as in, uh, constraints imposed by institutions and imaginations on methods. It's a recursive thing. So one can actually affect the kinds of changes we're variously contending for here in both ways, I'd say. So yes, you need to pay attention to institutions, but it's not as if there's a deterministic ordering of those. And your dilemma with the unnamed uh, science advisor, we were talking yesterday about chief science advisors in the British context as well, of that single supposed honest broker view. Yeah, it's a real, a real dilemma. And it's especially bad when the individuals concerned are so engaging and open, as some have, we've been mentioning in our discussions are, um, then it's even more difficult. If they actually reject you, then at least you have a performance that you can, you can riff on and pivot on. But when you have this assimilative use of language, but embodied in this idea that there can be a singular chief science advisor who speaks for science, which is itself, to me, a very dangerous kind of institution, explicitly adopted in the UK to try and discipline science to come up with the right answers on various contentious issues. Explicitly, that's what it's for. Then one's in even worse trouble than you are with the rejection. Um, so uh, I think we just have to talk about power in science and put the, other, uh, the others on the position of having to somehow deny that it exists, which is, a, in the end, an untenable position. But it's an, an imperfect response, as usual, to a great question. Thanks. Uh, I, mean, I think it's important that we acknowledge power and doubt and uncertainty, but the stakes are pretty high here, aren't they? I mean, we've got an anti-vax movement that is playing on these ideas of there being power when, in fact, there isn't. There seems to be very little uh, scientific uncertainty about the effects of vaccines. We have um, overnight 17 school children uh, killed in the US and no, the, the inability to get any traction on that issue. Now there's clearly power there opposing evidence, but the capacity of the opponents of the evidence to um, invoke this kind of language, they've, they've become expert at using the very kind of democratizing kind of uh, rhetoric um, that we're using here. So I'm yeah. just wondering how, yeah. how do we deal with yeah. situations where the science, the evidence is clear? Um. Yeah, well, thanks. Um, well, I mean, my sister died from a complication of measles, so I'm the last person to in any way imply that these things are not massively effective. But to say power is absent, other than the power of the critics, is, is really, forgive me, but it's dangerous. Vaccines are at the same time a potentially enormously effective public health intervention and a massively lucrative business model for a very powerful industry which, apart from the military industrial complex, has no rival. The treatment of entire populations. So power is absolutely there. And just to recognize that in this sort of cartoon strip way doesn't mean we're not, we're not enabling ourselves to recognize the genuine benefits of some vaccines, but we need to look at it knowingly. Um, and I think also in the sort of set, the kind of language used, I mean, the Andrew Wakefield, wasn't it, uh, case, which was the uh, canonical case in that field. It's really interesting there how he, he conducted himself in a shameful way with respect to an undeclared <coughs> conflict of interest in a medical journal. And he was struck off and has been vilified for more than a decade now since in discussions like this as, an, as if he's some sort of unique infringement. That practice of insufficiently declaring conflicts of interest is absolutely ubiquitous in the medical literature. He was the thing that, that the power dynamic on his side, which was there and was nefarious, is absolutely unchallenged when it's oriented with incumbent political economy in the pharmaceutical sector. So if we don't talk about power, we really deny ourselves a rational basis for looking at these systems of innovation, which can be at the same time really essential 
but also prone to perverse action, which we must really ask the right questions about without fearing that it's a sort of Manichaean, either you're with us or against us type of thing, which I think is profoundly unscientific and irrational. So I think the way in which maybe most other things, the way we speak about vaccines is contaminated by that kind of, that kind of schizophrenic thing, which I, I really do want to challenge, even though it ends up with, with us appearing to disagree. And, puts, and there's a danger and a responsibility on my side. I do not want in any way to feed resistance to health interventions that would have hugely beneficial results. But for instance, finally, the vaccine resistance in Africa, for instance, to the extent to which one acknowledges this kind of thing acknowledges, yes, we have a problem with this industry. Yes, they are much too quick to jump to these things. Yes, public health organizations love to have plug and play kind of interventions that treat people as just objects. And we acknowledge that. We need to do things about it. But nonetheless, look, you, you've got to be much more trusted when you acknowledge those deep flaws in the institutions. And you're more likely, as work in, in um, West Africa has uh, achieved with the different ways in intervening around vaccination programs on Ebola and other, other conditions, uh, that you actually also tactically have a better chance of having people drop the conspiracy theories and the paranoias that otherwise are their own to, to, to their own detriment. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Thank you.